Good evening and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival Online. My name is Heather Woodbridge and it is my pleasure to be hosting this session from North Ronaldsay in Orkney today. Tonight's event is Music for the Winter Queen. The Orkney International Science Festival is entering its 30th anniversary this year and we are marking the occasion with our very first online festival. This year, we are delighted to bring a full festival program directly to you, wherever you are at this moment. This evening, I'm joined here today by Howie Firth, who joins us from Elgin. Howie Hello. Firth. <laughs> Hello, Howie, Hello, good to Heather. see you. <laughs> Howie Firth is a writer and broadcaster and director of the Science Festival. He studied mathematical physics in Edinburgh and has a deep interest in the history and philosophy of science. The music we'll be listening tonight is written by the Scottish composer Edward Maguire, who kindly gave us permission to use it, and we are hoping that he'll be visiting himself next year with some of his music, which has been inspired by science. This music tonight is inspired by the lyrics of the English poet John Donne, who, as we will discover, had connections with the science of his time. The music, titled Three Dunn Lyrics, is performed by the, Pais the choir of Paisley Abbey with bass flautist Ewan Robertson, who gave much help with the preparation of this event. Much help was also given by the Abbey's organist and master of the choristers, George McPhee, who's a regular participant in the festival. The story goes back 400 years, as Howie will now explain. Thank you, Heather. 400 years indeed to the birth of modern science, born during a terrible European war. The Thirty Years' War saw killing and destruction on a scale not seen again till the 20th century. Hundreds of thousands of people died or starved in harsh winters with armies living off the land. The war came from a mix of politics and religion in the Holy Roman Empire that covered much of Central Europe. It contained various states across Germany, Austria and much of Italy. It was a Catholic empire with some Protestant kingdoms within. Among these was Bohemia, which deposed a militantly Catholic king and replaced him with the ruler of the German state known as the Palatinate. His name was Frederick. And this is the scene at his coronation. And his wife was Elizabeth, daughter of James VI of Scotland, who since 1603 was first of England as well. A year later, the empire struck back and the Bohemians were defeated at the Battle of the White Mountain. Frederick and Elizabeth fled the Bohemian capital of Prague, hence the name of the Winter King and Queen. And it became a war of 30 years. Yet, when the century had started, Prague had been the empire's capital. The old emperor Rudolf loved the arts and alchemy, and he simply relocated from Vienna and left matters of society behind. His imperial mathematician was the greatest astronomer of the age, Tycho Brahe from Denmark. And Tycho's new assistant was the brilliant young German mathematician Johann Kepler, Johannes Kepler in Latinized form. Tycho had the data on the movement of the planets. Kepler's task was to see what model it fitted. Would that be the standard picture of the age with the Earth at the centre of the universe? Or would it be the Copernican picture of the Earth and the planets going round the sun? Or would it be Tycho's own model with the planets going round the sun, but the sun going round the Earth? Kepler began on the data from Mars. In the course of 70 different attempts over the next five years, he got so close to Tycho's model that he could have fudged it. But 
he was determined that the quality of his conclusions would match the quality of the observational data. He was looking for circles as for 2000 years, circles had been regarded as the only possible movements in the sky. Now, this was because a huge divide was seen between the heavens above and the earth below. Down here was a world of limitations and imperfections, but up there was perfection and eternity, and thus fitted by a circle which was seen as a perfect shape. And that's why they pictured the planets moving in an elaborate structure of circles orbiting other circles. The former were known as cycles and the latter were known as epicycles, circles rotating around other circles. Well, in 1604, a bright new star appeared in the constellation of Phaeacus. At its peak, it was brighter than any star in the sky, and Kepler started observing it. Today, we would know that it's a supernova, an exploding star, but its significance at the time was its clear clash with the idea of the heavens as perfect and unchanging. In 1606, Kepler's book, De Stella Nova, on new stars, appeared. He sent a copy to King James, the king had a great interest in astronomy and he'd visited Tycho in his observatory when in Denmark to marry the Danish king's daughter. And Kepler's book was also read by a young poetic Englishman called John Donne. He had had an eventful and sometimes stressful life. His family were Catholics and his brother had died in prison. He'd traveled through Italy and Spain and he'd fought alongside Sir Walter Raleigh. He'd started well on a diplomatic career, but he'd fallen in love with the niece of the man he worked for who threw him in prison. In 1608, he was struggling to make a living and in turmoil over religion. 20 years before, he'd written a song of adventure called Go and Catch a Falling Star. But now his poems were efforts to survive amid religious doubts, erupting in a cry of anguish.
by 69, the world had improved for John Donne. He was reconciled with his father-in-law and he'd received his wife's dowry. In Prague, Kepler published the news of a breakthrough. He had tried and tried to get the Mars data to fit a circle and it was close, but not close enough. He tried instead a flattened egg shape. That didn't work, so he moved on to an ellipse, which fitted the data completely. So Kepler had two of what would become his three laws of planetary motion. The planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus on the ellipse. And he also showed how the planet's speed varied around the orbit. He sent a copy of his book to Galileo, but had no reply. Galileo failed to answer various letters from Kepler over the years, and it's clear Galileo didn't like ellipses. But Galileo was busy too. He'd heard of a Dutch spyglass magnifying seven times. He experimented with lenses and by November 69 had found a combination magnifying by 20. He observed distant ships and then pointed upwards into the skies. And he moved fast. His book, The Messenger of the Stars, was published in Venice on March the 11th, 1610. It described what his telescope had shown, including the mountains of the moon and Jupiter's four moons. Now, these were hammer blows to the established cosmology. Something earthly, like a mountain on the moon, contradicted heavenly perfection. And four moons orbiting Jupiter contradicted the picture of everything orbiting the Earth. On the day of publication, England's ambassador to the Venetian Republic, Sir Henry Wotton, bought a copy of the book and sent it onward to King James VI and I. Four days later, on March the 15th, news of the book reached Johann Kepler at the Imperial Court in Prague. At the start of April, the old Emperor Rudolf received a copy from Galileo, and then on the 8th came a copy for Kepler himself. Galileo asked for Kepler's opinion via the Tuscan ambassador in Prague. Kepler gave total priority to responding. There were just 11 days before the courier would leave for Italy, and Kepler had no telescope of his own, but he managed to produce a pamphlet called Conversation with the Star Messenger in the form of an open letter to Galileo. He had the pamphlet printed in Prague the following month. Now, coming from the imperial mathematician of a great Catholic power in Europe, this gave Galileo, at the time an unknown scholar, vital support. He quoted Kepler's support in his application to become court mathematician to the Grand Duke of Tus Tuscany. He did not write to Kepler to thank him or to send details of his observations or even one of his telescopes. In the end, Kepler designed his own telescope with a convex eyepiece enabling him to achieve much larger magnifications than Galileo. Galileo rarely mentions Kepler's discoveries in his works. Indeed, he criticised Kepler for believing that the moon causes the tides. And to the end, Galileo doggedly defended the old picture of cycles and epicycles, the circular motions for the planets. Events kept moving. In January 1611, just 10 months after the publication of Galileo's book, came the first reference in any widely read piece of writing to what Galileo had seen through his telescope. And the author of this reference is John Donne. By now, he's left the Catholic Church, he's become an Anglican, and he's written a prose satire. His satire describes the head of the Jesuits going to hell and restricting admission, only the Jesuits are allowed in with Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler and Tycho Brahe kept out. Notice this inclusion of Galileo. It means that Dunn must have read Galileo's book very soon after publication. Now, some scholars suggest that Sir Henry Wotton, who sent a copy of Galileo's book to King James VI and I, some suggest that Henry Wotton is, by being a very good friend of Dunn,
And indeed, when Wotton took up the post of ambassador to Venice in 1604, Dunn wrote a poem about this. Later in the year of 1611, Dunn completes a poem which describes how Galileo's findings have shaken the old certainties. And there, there he says, a new philosophy calls all in doubt. And then he says, tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. And there's a realization of the implications for the future. And there it is, man has weaved out a net. What a beautiful image, thrown the net over the heavens and now they are his own. The old separation of the perfect heavens from the imperfect earth, the old separation has been, has gone, a net has been thrown to unite heavens and earth. And the intellectual turmoil of the world of ideas echoes the disruptive language in Dunn's poems of previous years, in which he links the upset in his own life with an upheaval on a cosmic scale, something that could even waken the dead.
while Kepler and Galileo were disrupting long-standing ideas in philosophy, Europe's political foundations were slowly coming apart. There was a delicate balance of power within the Holy Roman Empire. The position of emperor was actually an elected one. A small group of just seven electors decided. At this time, they were evenly divided, three Catholic, three Protestant, and one of the Protestant electors was the ruler of the Palatinate in Germany. The seventh was the King of Bohemia. So if Frederick, Elector Palatine, became King of Bohemia as well, he would get a second vote and tip the balance. And in the spring of 1619, while the Bohemians were deciding to whom they should offer their crown, the old emperor died. So an election was on the way, and that single vote of the king of Bohemia now held the destiny of an empire. That made it inevitable that the empire would strike back. And outside the empire were powerful states with an interest in the outcome. Among them was Catholic Spain. Frederick's father-in-law, James VI and I of England, was a cautious man who had grown up in Scotland with his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, in captivity in England, and with powerful Scots noblemen around him seeking to use him for advantage. This was little more than 30 years after England's narrow escape from the Spanish Armada. As soon as he heard the news of the old emperor's death, James realised the danger for his daughter and her husband if the Bohemians were to offer Frederick their crown. The king moved on the diplomatic front. He recalled his ambassador from Venice. This was Sir Henry Wotton, who'd sent him Galileo's book nine years before. He sent Sir Henry to meet Protestant and Catholic leaders in Germany. Two months later, he sent a mission to Prague itself to try to mediate between the Bohemians and the Empire. He was going to send Sir Henry on this too, but changed his mind, and it was James Hay, Viscount Doncaster, who went instead. James Hay was from Aberdeenshire, one of the Scottish advisers who King James had brought from Scotland when he became King of England in 1603. James Hay was described as a man of good sense who handled various negotiations for the king and was, quote, well rewarded and spent it all in a very jovial life. Well, that was the leader of the mission. The chaplain to the mission was none other than John Donne to us, the poet, and in those days, the Catholic clergyman who had converted to Protestantism at a time of great personal stress. And before the journey, the poet Dunn writes his hymn to Christ at the author's last going into Germany. So they go to Germany, but by August, they've exhausted all options for mediation, and they find they can do no more. And at this same time come two hammer blows to peace. On the 26th of August, the Protestant nobles formally depose the Catholic Ferdinand as their king and appoint Frederick of the Palatinate instead. Two days later, that same Ferdinand, deposed in Bohemia, is elected as the new emperor. And that makes Ferdinand overlord of Bohemia, and the issue of Bohemia now becomes a direct confrontation with the empire. In mid-September, Frederick makes the terrible mistake of accepting the Bohemians' offer and walking into the center of the gathering storm. This reinforces the urgency of Viscount Doncaster's peace mission, and even at this 11th hour, they continue their work. In October, they reach the Austrian town of Linz. And Linz has a famous resident, Johann Kepler. Kepler had moved there in 1612 after the death of the previous emperor who'd been so interested in scholarship and who had moved the imperial capital to Prague. In Linz, Kepler found a job teaching mathematics in the local school and at this time he was in his final stages of the completion of his great book on the motion of the planets which would extend his conclusions for Mars to all the planets. Kepler said that 
the only thing, the only heavenly body that orbits the earth is the moon. All the others orbit the sun and it's all in ellipses. That was the conclusions in the book founded on bedrock, Tycho Brahe's massive body of observational data, along with Kepler's own meticulous mathematical analysis. And one day in October 1619, Kepler had a visitor, and he tells us this in one of his letters. He says he talked with a doctor of theology named Dunn, and he mentions he was traveling with his majesty's envoy, and that was Viscount Doncaster, and on October the 23rd, Dunn, the poet, met Kepler, the astronomer. But by now it was clear that Viscount Doncaster's mission had little hope. Two days later, Frederick was crowned King of Bohemia and Elizabeth was crowned three days later. And so came those few months that led to the names of the winter king and queen. By the spring of 1620, it was clear that it was only a matter of time before the empire would act against Bohemia. And then King James made one last attempt. And this time he called on Sir Henry Wotton. He did it in a cautious way. He reappointed Sir Henry as his ambassador to Venice, and he told him to travel to Venice via Vienna and try to persuade the new Emperor Ferdinand not to attack Bohemia. When setting out from Greenwich, Sir Henry wrote a poem on his mistress, the Queen of Bohemia, and he compared Queen Elizabeth, compared her to a rose, the Queen of Flowers, and including images of the skies. You meaner beauties of the light which poorly satisfy our eyes more by your number than your light, you common people of the skies, what are you when the moon shall rise? You violets that first appear by your pure purple mantles known like the proud virgins of the year, as if the spring were all your own, what are you when the rose is blown? You curious chanters of the woods that warble forth Dame Nature's lays, thinking your passions understood by your weak accents, what's your praise when Philomel her voice doth raise? So when my mistress shall be seen in sweetness of her looks and mind, by virtue first and choice a queen, tell me if she were not designed the eclipse and glory of her kind. So that was Sir Henry Wotton's poem to Elizabeth, who at that time, for those few short months, was Queen of Bohemia. And on his way to Vienna, Sir Henry went to Linz and stopped to visit Kepler. And he tells what happened in a letter that he wrote to Francis Bacon afterwards. He says that Kepler showed him a camera obscura, which he'd set up. And Sir Henry offered, on King James's behalf, a new home to Kepler if he would relocate to England. Although Sir Henry does not mention any background, there were two issues that at the time were causing Kepler problems, and which he might even have mentioned to John Dunn on Dunn's visit the previous year. One of Kepler's problems was his situation as a Protestant in an area under Catholic rule. The other was the prosecution of his mother for witchcraft. Kepler was working tirelessly on a comprehensive defense of her, which he would put to the court using all his skills of reasoning and analyzing evidence, and which eventually, in early October 1621, would prove successful when the case had run its course and she was released. But at that time, he was committed to staying in Germany. That visit was in August 1620. And on the 8th of September, 1620, almost exactly 400 years ago this week, an imperial army invaded Bohemia. Two months later, the Bohemian forces were defeated at the Battle of the White Mountain. Frederick and Elizabeth had to flee from Prague and they found refuge in The Hague in Holland. And the poet John Donne refers to this battle in his holy sonnet 18. And it's words of anguish. Show me, dear Christ, thy spouse, so bright and clear. What is it she which on the other shore goes richly painted? 
or which robbed and tore laments and mourns in Germany and here. And that poet summed up, the poet and the poem summed up how the world had turned into a, a long winter for Elizabeth and Frederick. But their children grew up in The Hague and made their mark on history. And one of them, Sophia, Electress of Hanover, married the Elector of Hanover, hence the title. And when Queen Anne died in 1714, it was Sophia's son who became King George of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. King George, who was the start of the Hanoverian succession. His great-great-grandmother, Mary Queen of Scots, had been driven out of her kingdom so tragically. And his grandparents, the winter king and queen, had lost their kingdom after one short winter. But with him, the family fortunes turned round into a new period of stability. By now, the poet John Donne was long dead, and his poems remained in in obscurity for centuries. But eventually they emerged, and among them this poem, written in his darkest days of 1607 to 1609, when he realised how we need the blackness of the night in order to delight in the glories of the dawn that follows, and that sometimes it's only from being plunged into deepest darkness that we truly recognise the light. And this poem of ascension is truly the most appropriate for a winter queen.
that was excellent. Thank you very much, Howie, for pre preparing that. It was really fantastic. Great. Well, we've got a few questions here um, before we finish. Uh, let's see. Was We've got um, a lovely comment here on the YouTube live chat from Bill Graham. And he says, I've listened to Howie for many years and there is always something really interesting to learn. So thank you, Howie. That's from Bill Graham. Bill. And we've got a question from Julie. And Howie, why do you think Galileo initially referenced Kepler, but later didn't communicate with him or use his models? It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, Galileo is often pictured in history as, um, as a kind of victim. And of course, he, 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 was, he had to face a, a very difficult time with the, with, with the church. But Galileo also was quite self-motivated, was somebody who was quite forceful and tended to look after himself. And the correspondence or the lack of correspondence with Kepler is interesting because Kepler, although somebody who'd risen highly to the rank of imperial mathematician, was always someone you feel who never forgot his origins. He came from a dif difficult situation. His his mother was the the one had that more that more um, more income in the family. She kept an inn. His father was a soldier of fortune who went off and was never seen again when Kepler was young. Kepler had health problems, had smallpox had for a time and um, to be looked after by relatives. Generally speak, and throughout his life, whenever he seemed to settle in one place, it never lasted so long. There was religious problems. He was um, a Protestant, sometimes in a Catholic area. Sometimes there was different degrees of Protestantism. So Kepler, you feel, was somebody who had knew about life's fortune and was somebody who was who would help other people but Galileo tended to be somebody who was rather more self-centered gosh that's fascinating wow okay we've got a couple couple more questions um a uh, question again I think from Bill um why did Galileo not sell telescopes with his book to encourage supporting evidence uh, Kepler missed a trick too. Maybe nobody wanted to be seen with one. Uh, Galileo was actually quite good at, at business and he was quite quick at the mark because there is this question about when he developed his telescope. The, the telescope was developed in, in Holland, first of all, and he did get news that somebody from Holland was going to be coming to supply the Venetian Republic and uh, or to demonstrate the telescope to the Venetian Republic. And of course, uh, for a maritime power like Venice, a telescope would, was of tremendous potential in looking looking out to sea, recognizing ships and, and, and so on. And Galileo moved pretty quickly. His friend delayed the decision of the Venetians long enough for him to come up with a telescope. So I think anything that Galileo did with telescopes was fundamentally first and foremost about a, a, a business model. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few, a few more coming in. Fascinating stuff. Um, We've got a question, let's see. When, when was it finally, conf oh, excuse me. When it was finally confirmed that the heliocentric version of the solar system was correct, do you think that Tycho Brahe was considered a bit foolish? Just a bit like the flat earthers these days. The thing about him was that his observational data was so absolutely magnificent. There was nothing like it. Now, Kepler himself had an immense respect for Tycho and he promised that Tycho didn't live so long after Kepler came as assistant. He was, he was getting older, he was failing. And the story is that on his deathbed, he handed over it 
his, his, all that data, that wealth of data to Kepler, but he actually asked him to commit himself to confirming Tycho's picture of the universe and the, of the solar system. And the story is that Kepler said he would absolutely do everything. And that is the kind of context in which he made these 70 attempts to fit the orbit of Mars into Tycho's model. And he got within eight seconds of arc. Well, thinking about a circle as 360 degrees, each degree breaks up into 60 minutes, each minute into 60 seconds. Eight seconds of arc is about the separation. It's about twice the separation at which you can just tell one star is distinct from another. It was very, very close. And Kepler was very tempted, you could imagine, to say, it's done, we've done it. I've kept my word to Tycho. Tycho's model is the actual correct one. And he said, and words to the effect that um, Providence had given us as humans somebody of the extraordinary observation, observational abilities of Tycho. And in respect to Providence for giving us somebody as good as Tycho, we had to rise to the occasion and get our model, our mathematical model to fit absolutely and precisely. So I think Tycho was recognized as a great man and Kepler recognized him in that way too. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Howie. I think we're coming up to the end of the session, I'm afraid, but I'll just read out a couple more. I've got a few comments I'll read out to you before we close. We've got a, a comment from Maria Pierre Casarini. What a wonderful historical journey. Thank you, Howie. So sorry we cannot be with you this year. Congratulations from Italy. Pia and Peter Wadhams. Lovely. Thank you very much, Maria. And we've got another comment from Eddie Maguire. Thanks for weaving my three done lyrics and the singing of it by Paisley Abbey Choir into your fascinating narrative. So thank you for letting us use that beautiful music, Eddie. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I think um, I've got a few more questions. I'm sorry we don't have time to answer them. Um, I'd just like to close and well say thank you so much, Howie, for that fascinating journey through history. Absolutely excellent. And thank you to everybody who uh, was attending this evening. And thank you so much for asking your questions and participating. Um, thank you to our technical team behind the scenes um, who, you know, do so much work invisibly for us. Um, let's see. There are still spaces uh, tomorrow and the rest of the week for the PD Kirk lunches and at our festival club table sessions. There's a festival club tonight, so please hope to see you there. If you would like to relax around one of our virtual tables and meet some of our festival speakers, do register and join us for the lunches. The links can be found in the description below each PD Kirk lunch event on the festival website. And of course, I've said about the festival club tonight, and we'll be sharing that link in the live YouTube chat just now. So please copy it and come along. And if you are enjoying the festival, please do like us on our Facebook and follow the YouTube channel. Thank you again, everybody, and have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>